Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Captain Linnea Axman, and I'm uh, very happy to be presenting research design. Here's the objectives that I'd like you to accomplish uh, upon viewing this section. Be able to define just in fact, in fact what qualitative research is. List three assumptions of qualitative research. Describe four methods of qualitative research. Discuss case study research. Explain content analysis and discuss and describe methods that ensure scientific rigor of qualitative research. What is qualitative research? It's an inquiry process of understanding that explores a social or human problem. It builds a complex, holistic picture, analyzes words, and reports detailed views of informants. And at this point, I'd like to remind people that it doesn't just analyze words. It can analyze pictures, videos, um, historical information, which of course includes words, and it is most often conducted in a natural setting. What are some of the assumptions of qualitative designs? Qualitative researchers are primarily concerned with process rather than outcome, and they are interested in meaning. It involves field work, it is descriptive, and it is inductive. Why would you want to conduct qualitative research? Well, it depends on the nature of your aim and your question. Often they lead to doing qualitative research as your method. It often starts with a how or a what, and that guides your research design. There may be a topic that needs to be explored further or maybe explored for the first time. and A, a detailed uh, view of the topic needs to be presented. When we study human experience, we often use qualitative methods. When we study individuals in their natural setting. If we want to conceptualize a phenomenon, uh, I did a study on empowerment. I mean, that is a very abstract concept and is considered a phenomenon. If we want to develop a theory. And partic it's particularly suitable for research questions that social scientists, behavioral scientists, and nurse scientists ask. Here's some qualitative research methods, historiography or biography, ethnography, which probably most of you are familiar with, grounded theory, and phenomenology. Historical or biographical research, and one thing I want to point out to you, these slides will be wordier than your previous slides. And that was actually done on purpose, because qualitative research is normally involved with the word, the written word, and an analysis of text. And this gives you an idea of maybe the, the rigor with which a qualitative researcher must address their data. Historical or biographical research is a systematic compilation of data to look at critical presentations, evaluations, and interpretation of facts regarding people, events, and other occurrences of the past. Sources of data, again, include written or video documents, interviews, witness phenomenon, photographs, and other artifacts. Biography, or life story history, includes interviews and facts found in records, documents, and archival material. One example would be the history of the Army Nurse Corps, or a biography of Florence Nightingale. Ethnography is a description and interpretation of a cultural or social group or system. The goal is to understand the emic or insider's view of the study participant world, where the outsider is the edic view. Data gathering involves participant observation or immersion in the setting. Interviews, photographs, films, and interpretation by the researcher of cultural patterns. Field work is the major focus of the method, and this is often used by anthropologists, and you're probably most familiar with that. One example of ethnography, or a question that, you, that would lead to the use of ethnography as a method, would be, what are the bereavement practices of Filipino families? Grounded theory. And I know that um, the uh, facilitator for today's discussion is, uh, does a variety of research, but I think uh, considers herself a qualitative researcher. So if you have questions specific to any of these uh, methods, please feel free to ask. Grounded theory uh, studies is a study that generates or discovers a theory that relates to a particular situation. 
It's, be, it's based on symbolic interaction, meanings that individuals give to interaction with others in a social setting or response to life circumstance. Data gathering involves interviews and observations of individuals interacting in a social setting. And generated theory is explained in text and schematic models. Theories are grounded in the data, and this is often a theory-generating process. And to answer the question, why do qualitative research? This also generates hypotheses for future and further research. So one example of grounded theory would be, or the question that you would ask that would then lead to grounded theory, would be, how do women with heart failure experience their illness? And finally, phenomenology. Phenomenology, uh, the study that uses phenomenology, describes the meaning of the lived experience of individuals about a concept or phenomenon. Researchers' perspective is bracketed or set aside as personal bias. And I would submit that most qualitative research, the researcher up front talks about their bias. Data involves query through written responses or extensive dialogue or interviews with participants, and themes are synthesized to describe the certain dimensions of the lived experience. For example, the question that would then lead to use of phenomenology as a method would be what is the experience of hope for persons who have cancer? Measurement is primarily the interview. Observational notes, documents, and photographs are less often used. The qualitative researcher is the primary instrument in data collection and analysis. And I think that this is one of the ways in which qualitative research uh, perhaps varies the most from quantitative research. Qualitative analysis is based on data reduction and interpretation. It is a very lengthy process. I encourage some of you to give it a try. There is scientific rigor in qualitative analysis. Whereas in quantitative analysis, we talk about reliability. We talk about audit ability in qualitative research. And this is demonstrated when a researcher can clearly follow the decision trail of the research team and arrive at a similar or comparable conclusion. I would submit to you that many of your quantitative studies would benefit from an audit trail. And this is accomplished by using journaling techniques. Auditability is also demonstrated with in-depth observational, methodological, and theoretical field notes. They, too, provide an audit trail. Internal validity in quantitative research is mirrored in qualitative research through something we call credibility. Qualitative research is credible when participants recognize the researcher's descriptions and interpretations as their own. In-depth field notes describe researcher thoughts, decisions, and analysis. The analysis is done by a research team, and participant validation of transcribed interviews, the summary of the interviews, and or study findings uh, also lends to credibility. Whereas external validity is what we're shooting for in much of our quantitative research, we call it fittingness in qualitative research. Findings can fit into context other than found in the current study and are well grounded in the data. Research team questions um, of analytic interpretations communicate the meaning of the raw data and excerpts of narratives as exemplars are presented in the findings. So we're going to talk a little bit now about case study. And case study is an exploration of a case or in some cases multiple cases and I would maintain that multiple cases would make it a stronger study that you do over time through detailed, in-depth data collection involving multiple sources of information rich in context. For example, laboratory reports, x-ray reports, pathology reports, use of the medical record, um, even observational uh, records and notes. And again, it shows their data sources include histories, documents, in-depth interviews, direct observation, participant observation and physical artifacts. And for those of you that, I mean, participant observation probably is self-explanatory, but if you haven't used it before, it basically is where you are a worker bee in the setting, but at the same time you are participating, uh, excuse me, you are observing the process. The scientific benefit of case study is it's a way to open discussion. Hypothesis may be pursued in subsequent studies. So I would maintain that case study research is also hypothesis generating research. 
investigators must clearly articulate their method, their observations, so that others may replicate the study. So in, in effect, if you do collect or perform certain laboratory tests, please be, be very specific about those and in fact even how you went about collecting the physiologic uh, or biologic or markers or measures so that another may replicate your study. One example of a question that would lead to the use of a case study method might be, how does celiac sprue affect the health-related quality of life of patients affected with this disorder? And just kind of FYI, there are many, many health-related quality of life instruments out there. So um, if you're looking to develop one, please don't, <laughs> or just modify an existing one because it really is unnecessary. Another uh, an analytic technique, but some also use it as a qualitative method. Uh, it can be a little controversial, but I personally like it. Uh, it's what I do is content analysis, and this is a technique for making inferences by systematically and objectively identifying special characteristics or messages. It, it does look a little bit sometimes like grounded theory or phenomenology in that you do identify themes. But content analysis is kind of one of those, uh, you got your foot in both fields, analytic techniques, because it has both a quantitative as well as a qualitative component. Any item that can be made into text can be analyzed through content analysis. In some countries, such as South Africa, it could be, it's called discourse analysis. So if you've done research in other countries, you may have heard it referred to as discourse analysis. Criteria of selection for material included and excluded is set up prior to the analysis. So in that way, it is similar to uh, quantitative, although I maintain qualitative analysis uses inclusion and exclusion criteria as well. Manifest and latent content analysis are used, where in manifest uh, analysis are those things that you can readily observe. For example, a blood pressure would be uh, a manifest analysis, uh, as well as hair color, eye color, weight. Latent content analysis is when you use more abstract um, analysis, such as you're looking for themes things like anxiety, empowerment, even pain, although we know pain can be measured, pain can also be a qualitative um, data point. Coding is then performed, themes are identified, and responses are tallied and descriptions are made. You can actually do descriptive statistics um, from content analysis. And as you see in the final, final bullet point there, and as I've already mentioned, it's used in both qualitative and quantitative analysis. And I just wanted to give you an example. Um, and you may not be able to read the very small text there, um, so I'll help you out. But this is from a study done across four provinces in the uh, uh, country of South Africa where we were looking at those uh, characteristics that contributed to the problem of orphans and vulnerable children. The text documents from, a, uh, from multiple interviews and also from existing data sources, so secondary analysis of data, were assigned to what we call the Atlas TI Qualitative Analysis Document Management System. This is a qualitative software program that can be purchased. We actually have several copies here at the hospital. The data was then analyzed using the method of content analysis. Both manifest and latent content analysis were used. Manifest content analysis is the counting or quantifiable frequency of coded text and is presented in frequency format above. Of the 617 coded responses found across four provinces, there were four main themes that emerged and the percentage of total responses reported, so um, 617 uh, responses. And actually, it looks like more than four main themes, but I think we were talking about family separation, beliefs, information, treatment, prevention, and violence. And the final one there is resources for orphans and vulnerable children. Here's what interpretation of the latent uh, data looks like. And this was, again, having to do with HIV AIDS. What happens is the um, most uh, dominant node, we call these nodes, or most dependent node, is placed in the lower right-hand corner. And all of those variables or themes that contribute to that dependent node 
are listed then linearly. And then it's up to the um, investigator to decide on the interpretation of the data. And so we always start out when we describe in content analysis, we describe it as one interpretation. In other words, my interpretation of this data is, because there are many other ways that the data can be looked at. So I'll start out with one interpretation of this view may be that prevention of HIV AIDS is most dependent upon the belief that the man must always choose to use a condom, condoms must be used for casual sex, unprotected sex with the usual partner is always safe, condoms do not always protect against HIV, so why use them, and if somebody is in a monogamous relationship, they don't need to use a condom. So this is information that was collected in the province in which Ladysmith, the town of Ladysmith, exists. And this was how the data was interpreted around how to prevent HIV AIDS. And all these other themes and beliefs were related to the prevention of HIV in this specific town. Just for your information, the community then went on to develop an HIV AIDS prevention program using this qualitative data.